Exponential technology is changing the way we live, work, and play. But the human mind does not deal with exponential thinking very well. We are seemingly on the first step of a staircase that promises to carry us into an unknown future that many of us are simply not prepared for. So to understand the current states of the world's most powerful exponential technology, I have traveled to London Tech Week to meet up with some of the world's leading technologists and thought leaders to help you understand the implications of these technologies on your world. My name is Matt Brown, and this is The State of X. This is the biggest and most ambitious festival of technology this country has ever seen. The printing press is arguably one of the most disruptive innovations the world has seen. Its immediate effect was that it spread information quickly and accurately, and consequently it took a hundred years for the world to fully ingest the impact of distributed information dissemination. But today the world is moving on to an exponential trajectory, meaning entire industries have only a matter of a few years to adapt to modern exponential technologies like artificial intelligence, blockchain and robotic process automation. This underscores more than ever the need for companies to transform themselves from traditional ways of working towards innovative new business models, products, and services. So, what is the current state of digital transformation? Where does digital transformation start and where does it finish? So to gain an in-depth understanding on one of the industry's biggest buzzwords, I reached out to Lindsay Herbert, the author of the book, Digital Transformation, and the inventor and innovation leader at IBM. Hey guys, welcome back to State of X. Today, I'm privileged and honored to be joined by Lindsay Herbert, the head of innovation and inventor at IBM. Is that I get that right? Broadly correct? Yeah, Sounds very important. <laughs> so uh, for our viewers who potentially don't really understand what does innovation and invention mean in the context of IBM, why don't you walk us through just the headline? What does it look like? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing is with being an inventor is I actually literally invent things. So sometimes people wonder in today's day and age, do you actually still solder? Do you still write code as an inventor? And yes, you do. Oh, you, know, really? you still do the, the hard work. Um, and I think the advantage of being an inventor in the context of IBM is that I can take inventions that I work on myself and with others and put them into real environments, actually test them and see, you know, get them working in the real world. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then the innovation leadership part of my role is actually finding other companies, other really clever, innovative startups and scale-ups and introducing them to IBM clients. because. Uh -huh. The nature of the world today is we have too many massive problems to solve. Yeah. No one company can solve them. Mm -hmm. It's about building an ecosystem of people who can collaborate together and tackle those major problems together. Um, and exactly, and it's about tackling the right problems, right? Because yes. you know, out of all the potential problems you can solve, like you tackle the right ones. I mean, this is more broadly about a digital transformation agenda, right? Yeah. You actually wrote the book on digital transformation towards the end of 2017. Um, I don't think digital transformation ever really stops no. anymore. I mean, it's like a journey that's, you know, you don't really get to the destination. Um, but do you feel that digital transformation is as important today as it ever was? So the way I define digital transformation is just being adaptive to change itself. Mm. And the reason that it's digital yeah. is because you can't be adaptive to change anymore without utilizing technology, without utilizing data. But fundamentally at its core, it's about people adapting to a changing world. And you're absolutely right. You have to keep adapting because change is not going to stop. It's just going to accelerate. So, you know, the book that I wrote and the work that I do in IBM is all about the how-to of innovation. So many people think that it's about being agile and doing design thinking and building a prototype and then bang, you're innovative. Yeah. But what they don't realize is you get to the end of that prototype and you've effectively built a doll's house and are expecting real people to be able to move into it. So how do you actually get from a cool idea to something that's scaled and useful and solving a worthy problem? That's a whole specialist field in itself, and that's what I that's what I do. And at the same time, not having the uh, corporate antibodies come and kill innovation, right? Because <laughs> I mean, that's yep. the, that that's the biggest challenge. It's like yep. you know, people love to talk about innovation. They love to talk about digital transformation, hackathons, and hackathons, and this and that. And it doesn't seem to really wind up anywhere. You know, it's like the corporate. Um, if you think about a corporate shareholder structure, right? So I'm motivated to 
give a return to my shareholders. Yeah. So why would I take you know a million pounds out of my PL and stick it into something innovative just to say that I'm innovative? Exactly, and that's why part of my role and you know in working within the bigger IBM machine is in getting people who have those senior level positions to understand the real immediate threats to their livelihoods and their business and what to do about it in a more strategic level rather than just hosting a random hackathon which all that does is it gets those C-suite people thinking, oh great, so you've already solved the problem. Oh wait, it's gonna cost another 200,000 to actually get it to the point where it's usable? Let's do it next year. Uh -huh. you know? So that education process has to start much sooner and you also have to turn them into people who want to innovate. So many people have gotten to the top level of an organization by maintaining the status quo, by yep. being risk averse. Yep. They don't want to risk their jobs, numbers. right? Exactly. And their updates of their Range Rover in 2020. Exactly. You know and so I mean? you need to help them understand the, the immediate and the near term threats and opportunities so that they can see their own success in fueling something that otherwise they're just going to link to a different part of the business, the part of the business that's focused on digital experience. One of my most hated terms, digital experience, is if we all spend our lives just you know, using a single app and a single website. It's done. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I know, exactly. Hashtag digital experience. <laughs> so, no. no, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but look, what do you say to the frustrated head of innovation, right, who, you know, um, is trying to get a established legacy business to innovate, to adopt, and even engage with startups, you know? Yeah. Um, what do you say to them if they're sitting around going, I can't actually do this job, they love talking innovation, but they don't actually want to change. Yeah, you know, yeah. what kind of incentives or words of wisdom would you like to share with that frustrated innovation person? My, my book talks about five stages to do real innovation, and the first stage is about getting inspiration from outside the company. Too many companies focus entirely on what the company is already doing and just trying to optimize it. Having those arguments internally about, oh, we could be you know this many percentage points better if we just tooled this a little bit differently, they have to get the hard-hitting evidence, which is about a competitor doing it better and reaping the rewards, about a, a, another company that's serving the same audience but in a different way, and what the opportunities are there. It's about getting, bridging those gaps, showing that inspiration, and again, getting those leaders to go on that journey. Uh -huh. And then the worst thing you could do is to skip that step and to go straight into prototyping. Yeah. Because you'll get nowhere. Yeah, I understand. So let's talk about startups. You know, there's loads yeah. of uh, people talking about, you know, startups are either going to eat corporate lunches, uh, and so therefore corporates need to be engaging with the startup community. Oftentimes, you know, at least in South Africa, our startups go to corporates to die. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we've Wait had forever for a But no. do you find that do you find that also? Oh my god, yes. And then this idea of startups being a threat to big corporates, no, it's the other way around because you're right, a big corporate can waste a startup's time forever yeah. just to get to a no. And then by that time the startup's gone bust. Yeah. Instead, corporates that want to leverage cutting edge thinking from a company that could be a startup, they need to realize they have to work differently. You know, I did a great interview recently with the chief architect of HSBC about how they're working with startups and he said they changed part of their procurement and their legal department to give a stepping stool to a startup to basically not get drowned in all the paperwork that normally comes with a procurement agreement with a big company like HSBC. Totally. So that's part of it. And then the other part of it is it's really more about the scale-ups you know, a true startup is someone that's trying to still sort out their business model and just, you know, they're still finding their footing. Really, the big corporates are more interested in the scale-ups, the ones who have one big client and are looking for more, have one market covered and are looking to expand to a new one. Yeah. And, and if the corporates don't work with the scale-ups, the scale-ups could be a threat to the corporates. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's very interesting that, I mean, when, I mean, you basically do this as part of your mandate, right? Which is, oh, look, there's an innovative startup. Here's an IBM client. You meet you, and this is why. Matchmake. Exactly. You do yeah. matchmaking, essentially. Walk us through how you evaluate making the best connections possible. Okay. So the first thing for me, and the advice I always give to any startup or scale-up, is have a really concrete USB. Have one thing you do really well and be able to prove out tangibly where you've done that and then only talk about that. You know, I've, I've been in the summit and I've seen so many great booths. The best booths for, for, for me are the ones that have a clear problem statement and solution, and the worst ones are the ones you look at and we're like, we do storage, we do cloud, we do this, we do this, and you just think, 
you don't know what, how to, you know, that's not a clear problem I can go out and find, you know, a solution to. So I think that's part of it. And then it's a case of articulating that problem. They might have solved it for one sector or one market. How can it be translated to an IBM client that absolutely needs that new technology or that approach has been developed, but that case study might not exactly match up. So how do you do that translation piece is yeah. the other part of that. Yeah. Yeah. So behind us here, we've got Startup Innovate, uh, which is a Canadian initiative. Um, you've and got, I'm Canadian. And you're Canadian, just happen to be Canadian. You know Perfect. what I'm saying? You know, match made in heaven here. Uh, but, um, you know, it's interesting looking about what we're talking about, and there's a whole bunch of startups pitching their stuff. You know, um, where does it fall flat? For startups. So startups, uh, I've seen so many startup pitches, and the worst <laughs> ones for me are they make two, one of two mistakes. One is they spend too long talking about the big industry problem and the bigger picture problem they're trying to solve, and they waste all their time in the pitch and don't get to the thing about what they actually do. But then the other part is that they don't have a clear next step at the end. If you're a, if you're a small startup of just a handful of people. Don't pitch to a giant company that you can take on a full account. Instead, have a really clearly articulated path that is practical for that bigger company to engage with you with and make that really clear and defined in your pitch. And if you're pitching to a general audience, pitch to what your strengths and current capabilities are. Do not start talking about what's in the pipeline in terms of what you might be able to do if you've got a huge round of investment in another six months of time. Yeah. Just, um, you know the statement that uh, venture capitalists back the jockey, mm. but they're gambling on the horse? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is that equivalent statement in the corporate speak or corporate world when they're looking at engaging with startups? Are they looking to back the jockey? Are they looking to back the business case? What's there, the difference there? there? So from IBM's perspective, we want the, the actual clever solution. So we want the horse. If we don't have faith in the jockey, then it's a non-starter. Yeah. But I think the other piece of it is we need that horse to have proven it's already ran several races and won them because being able to just talk about the technology without being, I mean, IBM pitches for its work in the same way that anyone pitches for work. We show where we've done it before. So you need to be able to do that as well. And if there's a gap in what you say you can do and the work you've already completed, then you're not going to get the backing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great points. So we're here obviously at London Tech Week 2019. Were you here last year? No, I wasn't. Fantastic. Even better. So, <laughs> but uh, looking around at, you know, obviously we, this is a very AI focused, uh, you know, day within the London Tech Week kind of, you know, week. Um, what would you say are some of the key trends that executives, okay. business leaders need to be paying attention to today and tomorrow? So the most important one is AI and the fact that AI right now is actually quite stupid. It Do you needs, think that though? Yes. Is it really? Because everyone else here seems to have a different opinion. No, AI is quite stupid. When you consider what the general public thinks it's capable of. That's true. Exactly. And then That's you look true. behind the curtain and uh -huh. you see that a lot of it is still being powered by either a mass amount of data being poured in to be able to get 90% accuracy, mm. or you've got a lot of clever data scientists working behind the scenes yep. to tool things and, and optimize things. So AI has this massive potential to, to get to a point where it will be very smart and solving all sorts of problems with minimum human intervention. But we are in a point right now, defined as narrow intelligence, where if you don't have the right people working directly with the AI to train it and to train it on the right data, you're screwed. And so many of these projects are going ahead and you know and being accepted you know oh 90 accuracy well 90 accuracy is pretty dangerous when you think about some of the news stories that are already come have already come out about bias in ai producing terrible outcomes for people applying for credit cards or yeah. mortgages or criminals being decided about extending their sentence you know you see some of these headlines and you think, my God, the bias that's being built into these AI systems, but it's because people aren't getting more involved. They're leaving it to the data scientists and the computer scientists. There's a huge human element that needs to go into training AI and understanding how it needs to be applied. That's the trend that needs that, that C-suite and below, everyone needs to be paying attention to. Okay. And, I, and I think there's another reason for it too, though, is that if you want your skills to be relevant in 10 years' time, yeah. you need to start building AI skills now. Yeah. Don't wait until it's so advanced that the computers don't need us anymore. <laughs> yeah, we want to avoid that situation. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, just a couple more questions. 
So how do you know which AI to trust? You know, we've, we've met loads of companies here all doing rad stuff in AI, right? So how do you know who is actually, you know, cooking the meat and who's leaving it a bit too rare for you? So I would say you never trust an AI, you trust the people that are, you know, and you trust the approach and the methodologies that's be, that are being used to develop it, to train it, and if you don't understand, and someone can explain the how that sits behind their algorithm or their neural network, that's a red flag. Yeah. You, know, you definitely, it's still a very heavily, you know, like I was saying before, it's still all about the people, and if all you're seeing is the machine and you're not seeing the wizard behind the curtain, uh -huh. that's a warning sign. Amazing. Lindsay, why do you do what you do? What gets you out of bed in the morning? So I've loved innovation since I was a little kid. I grew up in northern Canada with the polar bears and the uh -huh. northern lights and everything. And for me, innovating was a way of, firstly, getting me out of northern Canada in minus 50 <laughs> degree winters. Um, but also, too, you know, like I, I'm someone who's just always excited by what what's possible you yeah. know I've never been someone who likes just accepting the status quo when I can see something that needs changing about it and we are facing a world right now with major global problems mm. how could you not want to be an innovator how could you not want to try to solve those absolutely agree yeah. Lindsay Herbert thanks for being on the show thanks so much Matt awesome cheers, cheers.